Hi, we are Kim Beaton and Yvonne Anderson from Paltaya International. And Kim and I have been talking recently. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions from our existing customers and potential customers about how we go from creating something or how we might start a project to actually installing it, right? So um, how, do you, how do you get go from that first idea to actually seeing your artwork in the public, I guess, or out in your garden or for sale? Well beginning typically I see something out in the real world that I want now I love history and I love ancient ancient architecture and I am half Norwegian so I love the old Nordic Stav churches there's only about 17 of them left in the world they're about 700 years old so nearly a millennium they are all made of timber and they are elegantly and richly carved. And they've got the most amazing door surrounds. It's like, I want that. <laughs> also video games. One of the reasons we do video games is they are immersive to a world. You drop in and you see worlds you've never imagined, whether it's Celtic or Nordic or Maori or alien. And I want that in the real world and I can do it. And yeah. it's not that hard. So I start out, I see something I want, and then I spend a lot of time on Google search engines, the image search engines, and I see what's close, what's close to what I want. I'm going to put my own spin on it regardless. You can't mm. stop putting your own spin on it. Only machines can do a direct copy of anything. And that's what makes this kind of art beautiful, because you always have your own input into it. So when I start, man, I wanted a Stav church door. Okay, great. So we're going to um, show you right now on screen Kim's, Kim's door in her in the hallway and um, how this project kind of came around. And what I'm loving about these Q&As is that you don't even really need all the materials that you think you need to actually get going with something like this, right? So you can pretty oh, much absolutely. start with, yeah. You know, Sometimes you just don't want to run out to the hardware store again. Yes. It takes time. You've got a couple of hours. You want to be creative and you don't want it interrupted by buying other stuff. So this project was, hey, what do I have on hand? I mean, truly on hand. Do I have cardboard? Yes. Do I have tin foil? Yes. Hot glue? Yes. <laughs> like, okay, last one. Do I have paint? House paint, used house paint. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if I had all of those, I can start, work through, and finish this project. And that's why I chose it. I wanted something discrete, which means bounded. And this was a perfectly discrete project. Excellent. And it's and it gave me when when I saw, like obviously I have the privilege of speaking to you every every week. So I get to see what you're up to and um I get to kind of get your help on things that I'm making as well and so why wouldn't we share that with other people right um right. so so you did the you did the search and you found some some images which are going to be on screen now just you know of of things in the real world that existed that really inspired you to to get get those creative juices flowing um and so talk me through that process of when you find something and you know it's something that inspires you do you start then drawing like um figuring it well, out first thing you... i do is i measure my door that's <laughs> like oh. okay let's get a grid down so i'm not just drawn out wild anywhere you have to have the direct measurements of the door and the surround so that you draw within that and i mm -hmm. like off sketching on grid paper because it resolves all your issues you don't yeah. have to make the drawing perfect it just has to be there because you don't feel solve it in the sculpt it's fine so once it's been gridded out and i've drawn in all the sketches i'll probably on a single sheet do three or four designs yeah. and that way something to choose from once it's gridded out the next step is to cut the cardboard base which is this was 40, no, it was 27 centimeters by 200 centimeters high. And cut that glue together two layers of that cardboard till you have essentially a core. Now, if I had plywood on hand or MDF, sure, I'll use that. But if you don't, it's not going to stop me from going forward. 
yeah and that's the, that's the beauty right it's like you don't need everything there's there's ways you can figure things out and try different ways of working and if you know that you don't have that mdf on hand or you know maybe you've got something else there that you can think okay maybe if i yeah if i glue these two pieces together it's going to essentially be a really robust um armature yeah four so that, layers of cardboard is almost a piece of timber um yeah. it is it gets really stiff so having gotten a cardboard base, mm -hmm. then I grid it. I literally draw the grid every five centimeters this way, that way. And then I do a grid transfer. So you literally put your pen or a stylus on the grid sheet, and then you put your pencil on the cardboard. Yep. What you're looking for is where your lines intersect the grid lines. You're never drawing what's in the square only where your line connects with the blue line. Mm. And so blue line to blue line to blue line, and you can work at a clip as complex as that door surround was. It only took me about two hours to completely grid it up. Yeah. If I'd had a printer, that would have gone a whole lot faster, but I didn't have a printer, man. I didn't. And printing something can actually take longer because if you've got a fuss with the digital programs, and then scale it up and then run down to the printer or find one. Man, two hours, I had it completely gridded and I was off and away. Excellent. And that's when when I saw the bit where you were moving the pen to to moving the tiny little drawing, that was like, that's genius because that's such a simple way of actually starting to to make your armature and get the um the dimensions correct, right? So yeah. Yeah, really, really cool. A lot of what I'm dealing with is the stuff you have on hand. I don't. I try to stay away from really esoteric mm. equipment printers because they, you know, the power goes out or whatever. Man, you just can't get to the work. I know the old techniques. Now I started learning the stuff out of the Renaissance, and this is exactly the way you would have done things like a thousand years ago. So it still works, and even yeah. in our modern technological age, it <laughs> still functions. A pencil doesn't need a battery. Um, so having gridded that up, got it all drawn on, then I get a big felt tip pen and I darken the lines because that yeah. way I can see it. I can yeah. step away from it and go, yeah, that's good. Or, ooh, that sucks. <laughs> so, <laughs> to do that louder bit. And you check it against the door. Do you like it? Because yeah. this is where you have a fast fail. Oh, <laughs> you, you hope it works. Once you've got that, then the rest is sculpting. So half of your time will have been, no, about a third. One third mm -hmm. of your time is drawing and gritting. One third is tinfoil. One third is painting. Yes, yes, excellent, excellent. And that actually, even that bit was, was got my creative juices flowing and I was like, I, I started thinking of door panels that I could do because obviously I'm just beginning my sculpting journey, whereas you have done this for what, 25 years, longer? 30. 30. Yeah, so, I'm showing the yeah. gray. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, since you were 10 years old, you've been sculpting. <laughs> <laughs> um so so you once once you'd got to the stage of you had mocked it up you'd drawn it on to the cardboard you got you liked what you saw um what was the next step let's let's take people through okay, that next step is you have to make a whole lot of tin foil cigars oh mm. my god <laughs> hundreds of but they're fast to make you make them by rolling tin foil out on a an ordinary bath towel. Now you have to tape the bath towel down because while you're rolling, it'll scoot across the table. A lot of the time when when we've been on the road together, we've done we've done classes, we've done lots of um talking about about sculpting in tinfoil. Tell tell everyone what it is about sculpting in tinfoil that you like because I really if, if people haven't heard the story about, you know, um, shiny side in, dull side out. Like, what is it about sculpting in tinfoil that is so immediate and and um, easy for you? I love tinfoil. It was one of the first sculpting materials I ever got exposed to. We like it because it's fast. It's cheap. You can make mistakes and it doesn't matter. But you can go big. You can go mm. fast. 
artist. I love that. So yeah. when I started sculpting, my first piece was essentially a dragon about the size of an Irish wolfhound. So a fairly large sculpt stood about yeah. maybe three and a half feet high. And I was able to complete that in a day because by mm. crumpling up a tinfoil, you can capture air very rapidly. And that means you build up and then compress down just that surface to a final. So I use it for maquettes and sketching and even final pieces like this door surround. Yeah, and, and that's what I loved because when you start shaping it, and you'll see on screen now that when you start shaping the, the tinfoil into, you can actually get it to do exactly what you want it to do by like what you're saying, rolling it. And I loved how you you got those kind of um, 3D sh shapes with it, how you pressed it on the table and, you know, and then glued it on. So it's it's a perfect way of making it look exactly how you want it to look and making it look like your your vision coming coming to life. Now, for this particular one, the style is done in a calligraphic line. That's what mm. a cigar shape is. That's why I didn't crumple a whole bunch of balls and try to force that line. This yeah. is a long, sinewy design. And when you roll a cigar, it is a perfect calligraphic line. It goes mm. from tiny to fat to tiny again. And when you bend that in three-dimensional space, it has such volume. And yeah. so you're literally... Like you would be drawing a pencil, you're drawing three-dimensional lines in foil. And yeah. it goes just fast. Now, the spine that I press into it, that has a purpose of creating a beveled, planed edge to the baseboard. Mm -hmm. It means paint um, won't creep underneath it, and it gives a good, clean line against that cardboard. If you don't spine it, there'll be blumps underneath that are far less interesting. I said blumps is a technical term. Blumps. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Once I glued everything down, I burnished it with the spoon because you okay. need that surface to go hard or you can't see it. The tin foil, even if you're using exclusively dull side out, totally mm -hmm. dull side out every time. Um, because you can see the sculpture then, right? Like yeah, when you burnish yeah. it, you're drawing those beautiful curved surfaces over the top. You're linishing mm. it. And then I take it upstairs, put it next to my door and go, yes, I love it. It's beautiful. <laughs> Let me fix that bit. But it's beautiful. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so I guess you would then need to kind of question, you've got this tinfoil armature. You could really do anything with it at this point. You could keep it tinfoil. You could paint it. You could put Peltire Premium on top of it. You could decoupage it. You could, you could pretty much do. You could do anything with it. Now you've got a core, you can go anywhere. Yeah. And I guess then the question comes in of if, depending on the heaviness of this, because obviously if you're using something like our product, it's going to be slightly heavier. So you might need a more robust way of, of securing it against that wall. Now, I could take the sculpture, even finished as it is, and turn it into Peltire Premium. I could. Yeah. I may not. Right now, I just want something pretty well. I've got time. So I would have thought of that at the beginning is, yeah. OK, it's going to be lightweight. It's going to be indoors. I want it absolutely cheap. Therefore, I'm going to use things like cardboard. I'm not going to grab MDF sheet because that's going to cost me money. Um, I am not going to use um, rasps and files and saws because that's a whole bunch of other tools I have to pull out of the drawers. What do I got that's like three tools are under? Yeah. So, so because it's indoors, I'm not even using an exterior grade house paint. I'm just using spare paint from painting some wood here. It's like, ah, it's brown. It looks like wood. Use it. 
Yeah. And so when did you when did you get to the point where you were like, OK, I'm going to just make this. I'm going to paint it just now, because right now you could have it painted. Then later on, if you want to do something else with it, you can. You have that freedom. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when did you come up with the whole, um, you know, painting technique? Yeah, chalk paint has been around for hundreds of years. It's a mm -hmm. way of finishing wood. So let's say you have an old ratty coffee table. Chalk paint is a is an acrylic paint or an oil-based paint that has been heavily loaded with a powder, either chalk, um, kaolin, porcelain powder, or in my case, baking soda. Mm -hmm. If you paint three layers of chalk paint onto a table and you polish it, it will feel like marble when you touch it. It's mm. cold to the touch. And it is a, it's a gap filling paint. So yeah. paint up three layers, then sand down, and it leaves an almost luminous finish. Now, I wasn't going that far, man. I just literally put one coat of paint on. I said, hey, that's fine. This is a door surround. No one's going to be touching it. No one's going to be walking on it. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's like a painting on a wall. If it were an acrylic painting on a canvas, you wouldn't expect people to be walking on it. So I'm thinking of this as a three-dimensional painting. Really, one cup of paint, half a cup of baking soda, and a tablespoon of water. You mix it, and it has a consistency very close to like a heavy cream or almost a yogurt. The chalk paint I'd heard about years ago, this was my second opportunity to use it. When it came to the paint finishes on top, like the dry brushes and the spatter techniques, mm -hmm. Stephen Saunders has been helping me out. He was, well, he's my neighbor. He's a very close friend of mine. And he was the lead miniature artist on the most recent Blade Runner movie. He also was the head art director for the Thunderbird series. So this guy knows his paint finishes. And it was important because I needed to know the spatter technique and his mm -hmm. particular version. So when you've painted it and then you've dry brushed to bring out all the highlights, it will have a tendency to look kind of craftsy. If you take a very pale spatter, so you mix paint up till it's almost cream and you, you whack it against another brush, you get these globules that will spatter out. Mm -hmm. Spatter and spatter and spatter and you're adding a dappling effect. Then the next paint is considerably darker, like a dark red instead of a warm cream. With that spatters, what it's done is it's given an entirely dappled effect and it moves away from craftsman or crafty looking and it starts to look very professional. Mm. And the more spattering you do, the more professional and like real stone it will look. Mm. I go all that way man I was just I wanted something done by the end of Sunday <laughs> so I just did two spatter layers but what you would do is um, a, a dry brush dry brush spatter spatter wash spatter 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 wash spatter <laughs> and put five or six layers on there and that's when it really looks gorgeous as it is my simple technique that i ran up there still looks pretty nice even when you're right up close to it yeah yeah and i loved how you did the dry brushing on top because that just brought out the kind of it looked like that cracked kind of wood effect which made it which aged it really beautifully um and looked wonderful one of the so, reasons dry brushes works is mm, you know the concept of a rim light right yeah okay looking at you the the chair behind you has a rim light on it, which means mm. it's lit from slightly behind, yeah. making a halo. Well, dry brushing does that. It puts a rim light on all the pieces, and that forces something to look considerably more three-dimensional than it actually is. Yeah, yeah, it looks it looks wonderful. And how I know that we'll probably get the question is how long did it take you from having this idea and looking at the the pictures online to drawing it um, and to actually installing it? How how long did that whole process take you? Just five days. Okay. And were you working on it all day for those five days, or just a couple hours a day? Uh, I was working on it about six hours a day. So okay. not all day, just, you know, 
really casual. There were a couple of books online that I wanted, I um, had in my ear. <laughs> just, I love learning about the ancient Roman Empire. And so it was a great way to just get books on tape, chill out, learn about the Romans. They're a lot like us in more ways than is actually comfortable. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, just saying, man. Um, I love it. So, Some people listen to death metal and you learn about <laughs> Um, it's fun. I like, I like talky stuff and yeah. books on tape is the stuff that gives me the greatest amount of joy because the work is really simple. You're using a different part of your brain. Listening to an opera or listening to a book is entirely different than sculpting, which is why you can do both at the same time. Yeah. And if, if anyone has any questions about anything that we've talked about in this video um we had a lovely we had a we had a guy contact us um recently and i guess this is kind of what kicked off the whole thing i mean we have been getting lots and lots of questions about armatures because our product is is such a new way of working for people and a lot of people get very um challenged by thinking about a cardboard armature or you know something that's that's so flimsy because then they don't believe that it could become very very strong um and that's what i loved about tim's question from ohio which is if you know if people are liking these and you know you let us know then we will do more and if you have any questions ping them in and we'll choose one that's quite interesting that maybe would apply to many people um doing sculptures and, and especially going bigger and things like that which a lot of our customers have have started to do they started off small yeah. and they're growing <laughs> <laughs> Some of these people are doing truly mammoth sculptures. Yeah, oh my God. exactly. You know, we're trying to create this community of people. We don't just want to be one of those companies that throws something over the fence and then forgets about it. We actually want to build a community of like minded people. We're all creatives. We're all, you know, either starting their journey or you know, quite advanced on the journey, that's you. Um, and and everything in between. And I think what we'll do next time is we'll probably answer that question and on screen I'll show you roughly what he's he's trying to do and then we can answer that in in the next next time that we do this um in the series inspiration to installation so I hope I've answered all the questions about how that was built it was a fun little project and it's little because it is something that can be done over a couple of weekends if you have yeah. only weekends to work on and you know I just now think, why did it take you so long to get back? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we suddenly we've got time on our hands, and you know, I think I think that's the that's the beauty of of creation is that you can start something and then walk away and then come back to it and have a look around it, maybe walk walk around a different side of it, and oh, see something you haven't seen before, and. I think it's a really nice way of, you know, starting projects. And like I say, it really inspired me to um, do a, a wall plaque for, for my door. And then obviously my mum and dad's door, because I know the one woman they see my own. <laughs> Absolutely going to love it. It's fast. It's fun. You get results really quickly with four. Yeah. And that's what I like. You can just slam something together and there it is. It's there in front of you. And yeah. Give it a shot. You're going to love it. Want to, you can show people what you've been working on for the top of the door, but you don't have to. Oh, ah, yeah. So what you saw was the side of the door, the top called the lintel. Here, I'm, I'm going to stand on the other side of it. <laughs> it had to include a dragon head. <laughs> love it. Of course it does. So this is going to be a fairly deep bar relief with the face. The head being a very, very deep bar relief, but it's still bolted to the background. And so when people come approach the door, the dragon looks at them. Nice. I love it. I love this it. Is, this, uh, this cutting and gritting, I've done today. So this, and the, even as deep a relief as this is, mm. uh, this is five hours of work. Wow. That's In nice. fact, I can check the sketch. Hang on. Check this out. So, oh, let's see. There. That's my sketch, right? Nice. But I was having trouble getting the face. So what I did <laughs> is I sculpted it, but I sculpted the three-dimensional face on it. 
So that way, when I was drawing it, I solved the problem of having a deep relief on an illustration. Yes. Because I drew that face like six times and it wasn't <laughs> working. But the moment I picked up a little tiny piece of Play-Doh, I could make it work. <laughs> so sometimes, man, you just got to go back to the original material. <laughs> yes. Um, that's awesome. And I, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that people will probably want to see um, the progression of that. And we, we might we might um, discuss that in future videos. Who knows? So keep tuning in, folks. Um, so if you have any questions um, for Kim or I um, about anything to do with your sculptures, um, send them to us and comment on this video. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know if you like seeing this kind of thing. Um, and if you do, then we will continue to, to work on this series um, for you. I want everyone to succeed. Yes. It is in my best interest that people have the best possible time and they end up with awesome pieces. So it is in my best interest that you have great experience. So yeah, send us questions. I want to hear from you. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for, for taking the time and um, discussing that with me. It was really interesting just to see the whole process from, from your inspiration right into getting it. And we've got a picture up of it looking wonderful on your door right now. And um, it looks beautiful. It, it does. It looks like something awesome. that you've found somewhere and just attached it to your door. That's it's ancient. like a video you know. game entrance, man. It's like you yeah. just right into like some World of Warcraft thing and then yeah. when I finish the entire door surround it's gonna be fabulous. Ah, can't wait to see it. <laughs>